out to the neighbors and church members, letting them know what is available. People can come to the church and pick up what they need for themselves and are invited to take something to, to share with others that they're trying to share the gospel with. It's a bridge-building ministry that has allowed us a way to have ongoing contact with many neighbors we would have no contact with otherwise. This has been especially helpful to many facing financial challenges during this difficult time. Through it all, we keep doing what we can and reaching out as the Lord opens doors of opportunity. Our prayer for you is that God will meet the individual needs of your church families as well as the needs of your church ministry. Church families as well as your church ministry. He also, we also pray that God will show himself mighty through these shared struggles and give you opportunities to reach others that would have never been willing to listen before. He says, stay faithful in the battle with the eyes focused on the one who knows the future and has not been caught off guard by any of today's chaos. Brother Bill Lyons, Jude 22. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ben, for what you're doing there for us, and, uh, sharing this uh, information. We do uh, appreciate Brother Lyons over in Japan. Uh, he has uh, been there long enough to watch his family grow and move forward and move on to other things. He's in a military ministry over there, and, uh, for the most part, and so his congregation changes about every three years when everybody deploys or redeploys, and uh, he has a few of the uh, Japanese people there, and, and uh, it's been really tough on them, of course, during this coronavirus uh, time. We do uh, want to uh, keep our missionaries before you in prayer and uh, invite you to support our missionaries through our Faith Promise Missions Giving uh, program that we have here at First Baptist. And, and uh, our missionaries depend upon uh, churches to be faithful, and there's been a number of missionaries who have, who have had uh, uh, really gone through some real dark times. And so if you would pray for your missionaries, they are vital to the ministry of this church. We believe that missions is the heartbeat of the local church and therefore uh, we they depend on us to pray for them and we need to depend on them to get the word out uh, around the world that Jesus Christ does save. Well let's sing another song and if you have your song books you can turn to 415 and uh, that is called Leaning on the Everlasting Arms 415. 15 in your song books, and I'm not sure if we're broadcasting. Are we still broadcasting, sir? Are we good? Okay. I, I got my, my wife is trying to follow through. Pardon us for our uh, lack of experience here. We have to go with the flow, and we want to do everything right, and we don't want to just spin our wheels, but we sure want to make sure everything's going right. And uh, please forgive us for... Uh, for any lack and if you uh, are one of those people who have a lot of experience in making sure everything goes well we'd like to talk to you about it in fact it would be good if we could uh, secure another camera that would give us a little higher definition and uh, we have borrowed the camera that we are using right now and it's been sufficient but we sure would like to uh, use something a little stronger and I can see this thing going somewhere with even when we're having church, there are people around that have been viewing our broadcast, and we want them to be able to see uh, what you see, and, and hopefully uh, we'll see uh, a greater outreach as a result of that. So if you uh, uh, would pray about that, we, uh, we don't even know what, where to begin on this. So uh, anyway, give some thought to that, and we trust it will be a blessing. Leaning on the everlasting arms, sing it with me. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in the pilgrim way, 
Leaning on the everlasting arms, oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Well, let's get started tonight, and we'll take you to the book of Genesis this evening, the fourth chapter, Genesis chapter number four, and uh, we'll uh, talk to you tonight a little bit about a, a man, uh, uh, the first the, the first son, uh, actually the second son of Adam and Eve. His name is Abel. The oldest son was Cain. Somebody said Adam and Eve couldn't raise Cain until after they got Abel, and so... Uh, uh, we see this, and, and I want to read here, beginning in verse number 1, we'll read down to verse 13, and it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare another, uh, and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was the keeper of sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond, shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that is ours when we can gather together to uh, open up the word of God and declare its uh, many truths. And our Father, we want to be uh, vessels in your hand tonight, uh, clay in the hands of the potter, as they say, And uh, we pray that you would use us and mold us and make us into the people you need us to be. Then, Lord, we want to hold before you those who we have called to prayer tonight. We think about uh, Brother Bob uh, Phillips' uh, sister, and Lord, out in in, uh, West Virginia, Liz Kennedy. We pray for her and ask that you'd put your hands upon her and and, uh, take care of her as she's had to fall and she broke her pelvis and asked God you'd be with uh, the neighbors to the Boyds, the Bertus, and as they are grieving over a death that has happened over there. And we pray for we pray for Caitlin Carmen and ask God you put your hand upon her and, and uh, help her as she heals from her injury and 
And Lord, I pray for Grace and her gallstones, Annabelle with her broken arm, for Betty Helton with her eyes and her spine. And you put your hand on her. Uh, we do still hold up Jessica Hill. And, and Lord, we pray for Pam Gray and ask that you'd heal them of the cancers that they are fighting. And Lord, we think of Jerry Hall in a nursing home with, that's uh, been plagued with uh, this virus. And I ask God that you would put your hand upon her and protect her. We pray that your protection would be upon all of our people, wherever they are. And then I pray for my brother David and his wife Kathy as they have had uh, this uh, surgery that's been delayed and they need to have some relief. They're agonizing and pain over this and and uh, trying to just uh, eke out a living. So, Lord, we put them in your care. Ask that you'd be with uh, all of our people, wherever they are, and we commit them, each one, into your care. Ask that you would be with uh, us here now as we open up the Word of God. And your Spirit would speak to our hearts, and, and your hand would be upon us. And, Lord, that the needs of this ministry would be furthered, even though we cannot be here together. Thank you for those who have been so faithful in their giving and and the outreach that they have uh, made possible because of that we pray lord that you would uh, bless our missionaries think about uh, uh, our missionary to japan brother lyons that you would uh, take care of him and his needs over there in the land of japan and all of our missionaries many of whom uh, are uh, in, on the field but some who are trying to raise funds, and they're just stuck, Lord. Some of them are. So provide for them, and I pray that our people would be faithful to uh, support our missionaries, both in prayer and finances, and, uh, and above that, even their love. Lord, just give us a, a, a grand desire to see your word uh, flourish. And Lord, now uh, go with us, and I pray your blessings on what is said and done in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the years in since I've been a pastor, good night, has it been 45 years or so, I guess, uh, I've gone to hospitals and I've been to uh, doctors and I've sat there with the sick and that have been in our church and, and uh, maybe some not, but uh, uh, the one thing I have learned over the years is that uh, sometimes a disease or a sickness that might be, fall on somebody can come and be there and and uh, you, you find out maybe somebody has cancer or something like that, and then all of a sudden it just seems like they're suddenly gone. And uh, I, I marvel at the quickness with which some of these things happen. And one of the things I think about Mike Robinson, he was our missionary to Bolivia for a long time, and, and uh, he came home and was in our missions conference in November uh, of that year, and then uh, by January uh, he had... He had passed away, he died of uh, lung cancer, and, and it was just uh, so devastating and so unexpected to, to me uh, for that. But I just remember being so shocked by the suddenness of that, and the speed and, uh, which, uh, was, uh, uh, which, in which the decay just kind of set in. I, I see sometimes some of the same things happening in our day-to-day -day life. So you, you go to the store and you buy some meat and put it in the fridge and, and uh, you buy bread and you put it up on the shelf and it just seems like you got it yesterday and today it's already spoiled. It's just so fast, some of the things that happen. And, and I reel it sometimes, I reel sometimes at how quickly some people fall into sin. Uh, they're serving the Lord, it seems like, one day and the next day they're, they're being destroyed by it. Well, such was the case when Adam and Eve, nobody had it any better than Adam and Eve uh, they began uh, their lives in the presence of the Lord. God created them, uh, man and woman. And, of course, uh, they ate of that forbidden tree that was in the garden. And when they ate of that forbidden tree, one of the things that happened is that they uh, had to die. Uh, they were kicked out of the garden. They uh, were not in the fellowship of the Lord any longer. Uh, they, uh, they died that day. By that, I mean they were separated from God. And uh, they were they were out to kind of live life without the benefit of the experience of others that might have gone on before them. They became the example to everybody else. And so uh, God blessed them after they got out in spite of the fact that they would die. God blessed them with some children. And the first one that came along was Cain. And uh, Cain was a, 
a tiller of the ground. And then there was Abel. Abel came along and, and uh, he was uh, the next, he was the one that would be, uh, be the keeper of sheep and so forth. And things began to deteriorate rather rapidly in their lives, just like it does in so many others. And uh, as they had these two, sh- two sons, to kind of make a, a long story short, uh, Cain got jealous of Abel and uh, he murdered him. Uh, this, no doubt, had to be something of a, a, a streak of horror. I mean, nobody had ever died before. And uh, Adam and Eve knew that death was going to be on the horizon, but they weren't ready for it to start uh, so quickly. And so they began to uh, react to that. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, Cain was uh, a man. They didn't have the law that thou shalt not kill in those days. So Cain actually continued to live after that, but he lived with the consequence of having the blood on his hands. Now, we often will make reference to Cain and point out his horrendous deed, but I want us to think about Abel, and I want us to think about some things that we can learn, and we'll make an application towards the end of the message. Now, if we can simply learn what made Abel excel in his life, I think maybe if we as Christians would identify with some of the same things that we ourselves can can learn and we can excel in our lives. And so here's some things that I want us to point out about, about Abel. In verse 2, the Bible says, And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now I want us to understand that Abel was a shepherd. He was a keeper of sheep. It's kind of interesting in the Bible to find out that there's a lot of people that the Lord seemed to have a heart for that were also in the scriptures they were shepherds for instance we've got Abel he was a shepherd later on we'll meet uh, Jacob he was a shepherd we see Joseph was a shepherd the sons of Israel or sons of Jacob were also shepherds Moses was a shepherd David was a shepherd And the people that the angels announced the birth of Jesus Christ to were also shepherds. And so was Peter. Peter was admonished to go and feed my sheep. And three times he was uh, said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. In Psalms 23, verse 1, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. So God is our shepherd. And so Jesus is called the shepherd. He's also called the good shepherd in John in John chapter 10 verse 16 he's called the chief shepherd in first Peter chapter 5 and verse 4 he's called the great shepherd in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 and you know what you and I are the sheep of his pasture according to the book of John chapter 10 now sometimes I've kind of learned that I can tell a little bit about people by the way they might treat their pets now people who don't have pets kind of keep me in the dark Brother Ben doesn't have a pet that I'm aware of, unless he's got a, a, a crab or something over there that I don't know about. But uh, here's what I've learned about people uh, and their pets. Uh, if they are protective of their pets, if they are providers for their pets, if they spend a lot of time trying to win the affections and adorations of their pets, uh, they have some hope. I think that they probably kind of bleeds into the character and you kind of learn a little bit about them. On the other hand, when I see people mistreating their pets, what I have found out is uh, that uh, they usually are the same kind of people that might mistreat other people. Now, if they would uh, mistreat an innocent animal, then what would they do if they were given half the chance? Uh, I tend to back away from people. I found out a long time ago if I'm good to animals, uh, I'm probably better off. Now, I've got a cat. I have to confess that I'm not real fond of. And that thing jumps up in my lap, and the reason I'm not real fond of it is after he jumps up in my lap, especially if I have a suit on or something like that, I have a wad of hair. And, uh, and I have to go get the, the little tape thing that you get all that stuff off with and uh, try to roll that off and, and make, it look, make myself look a little better. Uh, the cat uh, loves me, and I'm not as nuts about it. But I'll tell you what, the cat's never been mistreated by me. Uh, just uh, for your information, so you know, I, I, I like cats. You know, I don't, don't necessarily like cats, but I'm good to cats. 
Now, it's obvious that Abel took a lot of care in taking care of his sheep. And he had a heart for them, unlike Cain, who was uh, something, of, uh, uh, something of a tiller of the ground, the Bible says. And he seemed to have uh, little regard for Abel's sheep. I have an idea. I can almost see Cain and Abel getting into a little bit of a squabble there. Can you imagine Abel's sheep getting loose and getting into his garden? You know, sheep aren't really good for gardens, are they? And you can see uh, Cain threatening Abel with the sheep and so forth. And so anyway, uh, Cain had very little use for sheep. And I want to say this, that uh, Cain had, had, uh, had the issues. Now, one thing we say, Abel was a shepherd, but I want you to know something else. In verse 3, the Bible says that Abel was a, sh was a worshiper. In verse 3, it says, In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So one of the things that I, I see here is that worship was important. Now, sometimes people will say to me, it doesn't matter how you worship God just as long as you worship. But uh, you can't tell that to Cain. Cain tried to worship God in his own way. I run into a lot of people who try to worship God in their own way. And you know what? If it doesn't follow the scriptures, it's not right. It's just not going to work. And so here's what happened is, is uh, now, and, and let me just add this in here, that 3,000 years went by uh, at, at, before the Bible was complete, about that, I guess, maybe more, and, uh, and the Bible was, uh, was uh, complete, and yet here's Cain and Abel sensing a real need to do one thing, and that's to worship their God. And so uh, here's worship. Now, could I tell you this one thing? Worship is very important. Worship is adoring our God. Worship is serving God. Worship is uh, uh, counting your blessings, being thankful and praising God for the things that he does. And you know, I have an idea that it takes a thankful person to really worship God as God determined that we ought to worship him. So they went, here's what the Bible says. It says uh, that they brought, look at verse 4, and he also brought of the firstlings of the flock. In other words, it was a place that they had to go to worship. They brought their offerings to a particular place. There's always been a place to worship God. It wasn't in, out in the field, you know, for them. It wasn't in the garden patch, nor was it on the farmland where the sheep grew. It was at a particular place. Abraham, uh, he went up to Mount Moriah there to worship God as God instructed him to go. I also went to Salem, which later becomes Jerusalem. And uh, there he would give his offerings to Melchizedek, the priest, uh, the high priest, to worship there. Jacob went to Bethel, and there uh, he had that experience where he saw Jacob's ladder ascending, with angels ascending and descending. And Moses saw the burning bush of Israel and went to the tabernacle where the ark was and later to the temple. Today, today, you and I are commanded to go to the church. Uh, you say, what's the church? Well, the church is not necessarily the, the building as much as it is the people. But there is a place that we need to worship. And so we gather here. Uh, not very many these days because of a virus. But we are gathering virtually as we open up the Word of God in our living rooms, our bedrooms, or maybe at our jobs or someplace. And uh, we pause and we listen to what's being preached and we get challenged by the word of God and we get help by his word. I want us to understand that, that there's a place to worship. I hope that maybe in the course of your day-to-day uh, -day lives, you'll find a place that you can worship. A lot of times in, when I come over to the church, I go into my office and there in my office, I have a couch that is there and I don't just sit on the couch, but that's kind of my prayer spot. That's where I go. It's where I get along with the Lord. It's where I talk to God about 
many of you that I'm speaking to right now. You see, I want to worship the Lord. And when I count my blessings, there are times that I get overwhelmed with joy. I remember having Brother Park Sutton here. and Brother Park said, uh, if I ever get rid of that couch, he wants it. I don't know if he still wants it now, but, but uh, he used to want it. And the reason was is because he and I would pray there. There were so many answers to prayer that took place off of that couch. You see, there's a place that you need to go worship. Today, today we ought to worship in church. The Bible says, not forsaking this, the, the assembly of yourselves together, but so much the more as you see the day approaching in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25. In other words, we ought not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Some of you have gathered, you've, you've assembled yourselves together by, way of, by, by the way of the internet and so forth, and we struggle with some of that. I can't wait for the day when we can gather back here together and God's house with God's people and sing praises like we always have and cherish them. You know, you take those things for granted sometimes and uh, you long for them when you don't have them. I have talked to other pastors and I was talking to my daughter earlier today and uh, by the texting and, and she was telling me her pastor looks like he's getting really weary and uh, I want you to know I'm getting weary too because uh, I sure want to be able to minister to people and I'm not able to. There was a tip, particular place to worship and then there was a, yeah, a particular time to worship. Uh, the Bible says in verse 3, in the process of time, there was a time. We know that had to be for them the Sabbath or something of that nature. Each week we gather together here on Sunday mornings and throughout the week and we worship and we hear uh, from God when, those word, when the word of God is preached. And then here's the thing that they did is they brought a particular offering to worship. Now, Cain tried to bring the fruits of the ground. Uh, probably they were, I would have to say, they would probably be pretty good fruit. I bet there wasn't a bruise on one, one of the fruit that he brought. I bet that they were just uh, beautiful fruit to look at. Every now and then I'll go to the grocery store and somebody will decorate the uh, the uh, fruit stands or whatever they call those things there with beautiful fruit. Man, you walk by it, it's almost hard to walk by it because it looks so good, you just got to buy something. So you pick up apples or bananas or you pick up uh, pears or peaches or whatever might be there, and, uh, and you like that. But, you know, God did not accept the offering that Cain offered, and the reason was is God cursed the ground, and he could not offer uh, something that was cursed to the ground. You see, uh, it was not the same kind of a sacrifice. When life was taken from the sheep that Abel would offer, uh, God was uh, pleased with that. And the Bible says God had respect unto Abel's offering. And uh, it says, uh, in, in, uh, it says and he brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. He not only brought the blood, uh, but uh, he not only brought, brought the offering but he brought a blood offering without the shedding of blood the bible says in hebrews 9 22 without the shedding of blood is no remission and he brought the firstlings now when he says he brought the firstlings that indicates that he brought the firstborn lambs uh, to god as a sacrifice what does that say he was giving the very best that he had abel's sacrifice for saw the christ on the cross Cain's offering was, was one of ritual, on the other hand, of self-worth, of works of the flesh. There was little sacrifice. Oh, my goodness, we, we throw away spoiled fruit, don't even bat an eye about it. But uh, to give up a lamb, a lamb that was dear and precious and tender to him, uh, Abel's offering was accepted, but it was a personal loss to Abel. One dead lamb would never live again, you see. Uh, there was agony of heart over the sacrifice that Abel uh, would give. And he had to give it that way because the wages of sin is not bruised fruit. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is, uh, was the requirement. And what Abel was giving was kind of a picture of what would ultimately be given by Jesus Christ 
by God the Father when Jesus Christ, his son, would hang on a cross and there die for your sins and for mine. And so how do you give? You know, Abel's sacrifice was probably one of agony and heartache and, and grief. But how do you give? Is your offering uh, one of sacrifice or is it one of convenience or one of abundance out of abundance? Figs and apples could not perish and mankind be redeemed. You see, Jesus, the Lamb of God, had to die for the sins of this world. And so he paid for your sins and for mine. And so what we see is that Abel was a shepherd and Abel was a worshiper and then Abel was a righteous man. I want you to notice again in verse 4. And Abel, he also uh, brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Why did he have respect? The Bible indicates that he was a righteous man. If you go all the way uh, forward into the New Testament to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we call that uh, chapter 11 the Face Hall of Fame. And there is a man by the name of Abel listed there. And it says in verse 4 of chapter 11, And by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. You see, when Abel offered his sacrifice, God accepted it. His offering was considered, get this, excellent. It was an excellent offering. He had no other motive than to adore his God, to worship his God. It was giving. It was given from a heart that was full of gratitude and, and uh, love for his God. Uh, as it turned out, Seth would, uh, not Seth, but Abel would have to, it would not have to wait long to meet his God. Cain, on the other hand, he saw the offering that uh, he offered as being rejected by God. You know what that did? That made him jealous. And uh, suddenly uh, the rage of jealousy began to overtake Cain. Jealousy is a horrible thing, don't you know? It's hard to deal with. When you see somebody else, for instance, advance and you get left behind and maybe a job position or something like that, what can transpire in your heart is bitterness and hatred towards those that are good and righteous. Then murder is born into the heart. Now, sometimes I've had people say, well, I'd never do that. And yet we might and we probably do do that. You say, what's that? Do you know when you hate somebody else, you actually murder them in your hearts. First John chapter five, uh, chapter three, and verse fifteen says, "Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him." You see, if you hate your brother, you're already a murderer. You know, somebody says the Bible says if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. Now, could I ask you, does God see? You as a righteous man or a righteous woman? What makes you think that God sees you that way? And only you can answer that question. So he was a righteous man. And then I want you to notice down in verse 5, and uh, we've already kind of read some of this, but let me read it again. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, why, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up, against Abel his brother and slew him and the Lord said unto Cain where is Abel thy brother and he said I know not am I my brother's keeper and he said what hast thou done the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground now what I was going to say in this last uh, this uh, fourth point is that Abel was a martyr 
Now, Abel offered a perfect sacrifice before God, and Cain did not. And Cain was given an opportunity by God to right his wrong. Uh, after all, Cain would rule over his brother. That was the plan. That was, the, that was the, what was offered to him, uh, being the older of the two. Uh, you stop and you think what uh, Cain had the opportunity of doing. You see, the Messiah could have come through the lineage of Cain. And uh, it could have, uh, he could have been a, a blessing to the world, but Cain actually threw away his blessing that God intended for him to have. It was meant for Cain to rule over his brother and, and to do well, which indicates that he was superior in this sense. And, uh, but he re, 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 uh, refused it. Uh, he let a moment of anger that turned to jealousy, that turned to hatred, that turned to murder. Uh, it, he allowed that to, throw, to uh, thwart everything that God intended for him to have. I want you to know something. If you're a jealous person, uh, remember this. Jealousy is expensive. Jealousy costs you much more than what you think you can pay. Perhaps some time has, has transpired after the offerings were made. Perhaps Abel wasn't even aware of the growing hatred that Cain had uh, for him. And maybe Abel just, uh, well, he just might have been blind to it. We don't know all these things. But uh, Cain saw Abel as being blessed of God and, and himself being cursed. Maybe everything that Abel did seemed to do well, while everything that Cain did seemed to not do so well. And this continued on, and probably you could see the, the jealousy growing as time went on. And he got so irritated with them that he finally explodes. You ever see somebody just kind of lose their cool, so to speak? Uh, you better not do it because it might cost you more than you want to pay. Somebody said you can get more trouble in five minutes with a, with a knife than you can uh, get out of in the next five years. Something that we can learn from this is that you don't have to avenge yourselves. You see, uh, Abel was murdered, and his blood went into the ground, and, and the Lord said that, uh, that the blood was acknowledged by God. But uh, here's what we can do is uh, we, we've got us a frog in here. Just learn if you can hear that. Uh, the spring is sprung. I can tell that right now. But uh, we'll just ignore that and go on. But uh, something that we can learn is that Abel was not in a position where he could avenge himself. You see, he was already dead. Uh, we know that God avenges us for wrongs that are done against his own. In uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, uh, the, uh, Paul writes, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now we have an obligation to be martyrs. Did you know that? Brother Ben, you're supposed to be a martyr. Did you know that? Miss Mays, you're supposed to be a martyr. Brian, each one of us are to be martyrs. I'm to be a martyr. But a uh, different kind of a martyr. The Bible says, uh, he says uh, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Paul was a martyr. Therefore, uh, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we see that he's a martyr there. So we, we've seen... Uh, we've seen uh, uh, Abel as a shepherd and as a worshiper and as a righteous man and as a martyr and finally 
Abel is typical of something. He's a type. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, the Bible says by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. You see, after the murder of Abel by Cain, there's always been two types of people in the world, the lost and the saved. Nobody was more lost than Cain was. Uh, he could find no peace. He could find no place of rest. He was marked for life, according to verse 12 through verse 16. His life offered no hope to the weary and to the lost. He was worse off alive with a dismal future than Abel was being dead and in a graveyard. Now know this, that the world was not happy about having Jesus around, and that happened to him. And so you know what they did? They crucified him. Evil men cannot endure this, the sight of goodness in somebody else. They seem to want to run them down and put them down. You see it in politics. You see it in business. You see it in just day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it seems that uh, goodness is always under attack. I want you to be encouraged, though, for if it happened to Jesus, it's probably going it, to, it, and it, if it happened to Jesus and it happened to Abel, and uh, if it happened to James and if it happened to Peter and Paul and millions of other people who stood for righteousness and godliness, then we shouldn't be too surprised if it happens to us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 12, the Bible, Paul writes, he says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Did you get that? He says, if you live godly, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have people oppose you. There's going to be people that are going to try to stop you. Jesus said this. He said, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. In John chapter 15, verse 20. Now, until Jesus Christ comes and reigns, there's always going to be a battle that's going to go on between good and evil. Abel's life teaches us some lessons. Abel, Abel teaches us about how we ought to be, I believe. We should be a shepherd to others. Uh, find somebody and guide them to Jesus Christ, kind of shepherd them. When Jesus told Peter, he says, feed my sheep and my lambs, when he said this, he was also telling them to teach them, to win them, and to feed them, and so forth. Uh, you see, everybody teaches somebody. Now, put that down in your little notebook of memories you might want to remember. Everybody teaches somebody. Now, understand this. They may not always teach them the right things, but they're going to teach them something. Your kids will learn the good that you teach, and they will also learn the bad that you demonstrate. Everybody teaches somebody. There are always eyes watching you, good or bad. They will imitate you. I'm reminded of the, the uh, old commercial. We used to have cigarette commercials on television. And, uh, and, but this was one against cigarettes, and uh, this dad was washing his car and, and uh, had a little... Uh, little uh, daughter there as I remember and uh, she was washing with him imitating everything that he did and, and uh, finally he would sit down next to a tree and she would sit down next to a tree and he'd reach over there for his cigarettes and start smoking them and when she saw him doing that uh, she did the same she tried to do the same thing you see your kids are watching you your neighbors are watching you the people you work with are watching you Everybody's teaching somebody else. And teaching others is what we call discipleship. We, we are to shepherd other people. Uh, our Sunday school teachers, our, our uh, youth director, our, uh, the ministry of this church, the missionaries around the world. You know what their business is? It's that of shepherding. And it's sort of interesting when you stop to think about it. We're all shepherding when we're looking out for each other. Uh, we're doing the work of a shepherd. Oh, we might not say sheep and so forth, but that's what the work is. And then we should be worshipers of Christ. That's what Abel was, worshiping him as, uh, as he directs us. 
and not as we direct ourselves. That's what Cain tried to do. Worshiping your way has, uh, has to align itself with God's way. Otherwise, you're not really worshiping. Uh, you don't just worship when you feel like worshiping. You worship, I mean, some people say, well, I'll worship God because I feel good today. You need to worship God all the time, it, and, uh, and whether you feel like it or not. And then uh, the third thing is we should be righteous before other people, but especially before God. Only we know if we are really righteous. I'm not speaking about self-righteousness either. I'm talking about righteous living. You know where you stand at. And then we should uh, be my martyrs. In other words, die daily. The Bible says that, uh, Peter, uh, that uh, Paul said, you know what I found out about dead people? They don't argue. <laughs> you go up to a corpse and you'll never get an argument out of a corpse. And if you're a martyr, if you're dead and you're, you're, you're dead to this world and you're alive to Christ, doesn't matter what the world has to say about you or to you, you're dead. You can't argue back. You can, a, a dead person doesn't defend themselves. Martyrs, uh, another, on another thing, uh, martyrs always die for a, for a cause. A martyr always dies for a cause. Otherwise, it's just simple murder or something like that. Uh, there's a cause. Dead, you see, uh, we... We are to die. We are to die for a cause. And there's no greater cause than the cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul wrote it this way. He says in 1, Peter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is, which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We should be sure that uh, we are, uh, we are, uh, you know, a lot of people are thinking about, I'll be a dead sacrifice. No, God's looking for a living sacrifice. Go live for him. That's a greater sacrifice. And then uh, we talk about the type, the tip, how he was typical of, of the Lord in so many ways. You know, you have a type too. You're either lost or you're saved. Your life should picture Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Hey, folks, there's, there's so much in the life of Abel that we can identify with, and I trust that tonight you will identify with him. If you're here, uh, well, you're not here, but if you're listening and uh, are not saved, oh, I want you to be saved. And if you, uh, if you have questions, I want you to feel free to call me at my, on my cell phone, 410-507-4162. That's our invitation tonight. You think about it. You can call on Christ to be your Savior. You can, you can invite Him to change your life, and I invite you to do that. If you're a Christian, I want you to, to identify with Abel, uh, looking after others and worshiping God and uh, righteousness and dying as that martyr, a living martyr for Jesus Christ. Do that tonight. Let's, let's bow our hearts in prayer. We're going to have a song here in a moment. But I want us to pray and ask God to minister to your heart and uh, to uh, challenge you to just make that decision that you know you need to make for Christ. Our Father in heaven, would you change a life somewhere, somebody listening? Lord, whatever has been going on in their life, I pray that it would stop, that it would come to a conclusion. Lord, if the very first murderer, the first uh, man that was murdered, uh, can be a testimony uh, than we can too. And so, Father, I pray that, that you would move in hearts and lives and change people uh, to be what you want them to be. Be with the, uh, the song that we sing here, Lord, maybe just during the, uh, as we sing these words, as, you, as we ponder these things, I pray that the quietness and the quietness and the stillness of the, their heart, that they would surrender their heart and their life to you. And we ask this for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen. Well, I'd like to sing an invitation hymn. It's on 414 if you have your psalm book. And if you don't, uh, you can maybe Google it. But the song is Trust and Obey. I'm just going to sing one, one verse tonight. And uh, I'd like you to just consider what the words say as we sing this. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, 
What a glory He sheds on our way While we do His good will He abides with us still And with all who will trust and obey Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We'll tune back in this coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We'll meet again together, Lord willing. And uh, then, of course, next Sunday is Mother's Day. I'd sure like to have you here. I'd uh, like to have the biggest listening audience that we've had. I think we had over 40 this morning, from what I understand. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, incredible, I think. And, uh, but we want to uh, do that. And then don't be surprised if we show up on your doorstep, moms. Uh, we want to uh, honor you. If we can't get you here, we're going to try to figure out another way to do it because you're very special to us, and we want you to know how appreciated you are uh, during this Mother's Day, even though we can't get together uh, at these times. We do also uh, want to uh, tell you this. Uh, we are geared to having technical difficulties. Have you noticed that? We may not start on time, although we want to. We strive to. And uh, tonight we had a little difficulty trying to get the, the modem uh, doing what it's supposed to do. It says we were connected, but there was no Internet, so I had to take the time, go over to the house, unplug it, plug it back in, and wait for the, uh, the duration of time just to get everything hooked back up. But uh, if you just bear with us, if we're not on exactly at the time we're supposed to, you can do one of two things. You can uh, text us and ask what's going on. We'd be happy to answer your question. Or you can uh, just kind of hang on. Because we will strive to get on. One Sunday we got on about 16 minutes late. Uh, and so we've been trying our best to remedy all these things. And if you are listening and you are proficient at some of this uh, stuff and know how to maybe help us eliminate some of, this uh, some of these uh, interruptions and things, uh, we would sure like to talk to you or have you stop by and check out what we've got going here and help us to be uh, much more efficient. We'd appreciate that. Again, uh, pray about getting a camera or something that we can have here more on a permanent basis so that people can watch after we get into our regular service. Uh, we want to uh, make, uh, make an impact that way. I'm going to have Brother Ben come, and uh, he'll dismiss us in prayer. I appreciate uh, Brother Ben coming. He's, he's got his hands full. Uh, he's a daddy of three, and I, I remember those days when you had the kids and you uh, try to, and and he's a, a he's an uneducated educator. By that I mean he he has to learn how to do all this uh, video stuff from his home, and he says he's putting in about sixty hours a week. And uh, so, uh, if you would pray for him, and pray for us here at First Baptist, some of the things we've got to do. If you want to go do something, come come by the church. We've got work that needs to be done around here things that need to be fixed and changed. And this is a great time to do it when uh, there's nobody here and you can kind of even leave a little bit of a mess because there's nobody going to come in and look at it So uh, on the next Sunday. So, Brother Ben, you come, say what you need to, and then dismiss us. <laughs>